Well, welcome everyone to the eight. This is our last eight for the year for 2020, and we are wrapping up our series titled Uncertainty Ahead. The word of the year, actually, I don't know what the word of the year for 2020 is. I don't know if they announced it, but the word of the year in 2016 is xenophobia. Xenophobia, which is a useful word to have, I guess, for Scrabble. You can't find many words that begin with X, but xenophobia. Very politicized word, very politicized word of someone where you would see someone calling someone xenophobic if they are afraid, phobia, of someone who is not like them, who does not look like them, who does not think like them, is not from the same place as them, someone who might be a foreigner, who doesn't like a foreigner, for example, somebody might label that person as being xenophobic. But the, the etymology, the root of the word xenophobia, phobia meaning fear, xeno is the unknown. So in essence, the, actual, the word, before it kind of went into the, the political world, is fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. And let's face it, we all have some type of fear of the unknown. Fear of what this new job is going to entail. A fear of maybe going on a date and you don't know what to talk about and do you embrace the awkward silence or what? Or maybe the fear of taking this step to overcome this habit or wanting to find healing through this wound, taking that step is painful. And, and it, it, but it, it, there's a lot of fear. And some people don't even take that bold step in life because the fear paralyzes them and overwhelms, overwhelms them and, and, and they're unable to move forward because of xenophobia, fear of the unknown. So some of the biological effects of fear Let's face it, fear and anxiety and stress are for every single one of us, maybe at different degrees, but it drives us. Actually, a little bit of fear is healthy in a way, but I'm talking about the unhealthy, toxic amount of fear to the point that it can cause permanent damage to or even to our biology. Here are some short-term effects to fear. This is what, this is what um, I got from a, a blog saying the, inf the effects and impacts on the body when it comes to fear controlling us, when fear of the unknown is so overwhelming. We end up having a fast heart rate, quick and shallow breathing, tense muscles, feeling of weakness, and a high glucose uh, sugar level in our system. This can eventually cause long-term permanent damage to our system. I want to make sure I pronounce this right. There's a term called catastrophizing. I think I pronounced it right. Which is, in, which is a disorder that I always think of worst case scenario. I always think of worst case scenario, that I'm overwhelmed and paralyzed by fear, that I always naturally jump to the, what's the worst case scenario that can happen. It, it's debilitating because then all of my thoughts, everything is, draw, dri is driven, my fear is driven by always thinking of the worst case scenario. Just in case you end up falling asleep over the next 15 minutes, here is my bottom line for, for this talk. Life is filled with uncertainty. But we can walk through this life with clarity. Life is filled with uncertainty. And that's the entire essence of this series. Uncertainty surrounds us. And there's a lot of variables to the uncertainty. But we can walk through this life with clarity. We love certainty, right? This is what makes us move toward politicians when they say, I guarantee you we're going to do this and this and this. And when it doesn't happen, they just blame it on somebody else. But we love, we love to get certainty. We love certain, right? We feel at ease. Just, you promised me this. You promised me that. We love to, to find certainty, even though we might not really believe it. We want to hear it. Right when I was preparing for this talk, the only one picture came to mind. And when it came to living a life of clarity as opposed to living a life of always embracing certainty, it is this guy right here. I don't, know if, I don't know if everyone knows who this guy is. I don't even know his name. I ended up just Googling on Google Images. George Zimmerman, there we go. So he's a fabulous businessman because decades later, I still think his face. I just typed into Google, I guarantee it. This is the guy that said, you'll look good in a, in a suit, and I guarantee it. I remember seeing this as a kid. As a boy, I was like, man, I can't wait to grow up to get a suit. Actually, I didn't go that far in life, but anyway. But I, this is the picture that came to mind when I was preparing for this talk. Life is filled with uncertainty, but we can walk through this life with clarity. Clarity is saying, okay, I don't know what the long-term impact will be, but I do know what's required of me right now. 
What will happen? I don't know. There's tons of variables. But I do have clarity of knowing what is my next step right now. That's clarity. It's not knowing necessarily the long-term effect, even though we want to know. Don't we want everything to be laid out and not, not, to, not to us to be impacted by the fear of the unknown? But clarity is saying, I know what's required of me right now. And this is where my, my mindset, this is where my heart is. This is what my prayer is, knowing what my next step is. The rest, I put into the hands of someone who is bigger than me. And I want to point out this, this principle of, of, of this series, Uncertainty Ahead, of us to be driven by clarity as opposed to desiring certainty to the point that it can be paralyzing. It can be paralyzing to us. First, I want to point out, many of you know the story of Moses. He was appointed as a leader to lead God's people out of bondage, out of slavery. And as Moses is leading his people out of slavery, he's appointed and entrusted with this leadership role. And he's taking the children of Israel through this crazy journey through the wilderness. And, 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 and as they're wandering through the journey, Moses knows, okay, he knows from God, I need to take a step, I need to go right, I need to go right. I need to turn left, I need to go left. And he's on this entire journey. And here is a, is a beautiful ancient Coptic Orthodox icon depicting the leadership of Moses. And you see Moses here crossing the Red Sea, which is, which is a, a, a very highlighted event as they're crossing over from old life to new, from bondage to liberty. And as Moses is leading his people, he is entrusted and has clarity from God as far as what steps he needs to take. His, I don't want to say, his assistant, however you want to look at it, ended up being a relative, uh, is, is, is Joshua. Joshua is depicted next to Moses there as being the next leader to lead God's people from old life to new life. Before we go further, so, I mean, here, here's kind of the depiction. We're going from Moses leading God's people to Joshua eventually leading God's people until they get to the promised land, which is their ultimate destination that God has appointed for them. Let me just say this real quick. The Old Testament doesn't get any credit. The Old Testament, like, there's so many Christians I know saying, man, why do we even bother with the Old Testament? We should just focus on, on the New Testament. There's so many, like, weird and gory and, like, I, the Old Testament is kind of confusing, which I kind of like, and I'm very proud of over the past four, this entire series. We've all been looking at Jewish literature through it in this entire series to find principles of how we can make it through this life which is filled with uncertainty. So Joshua is appointed as being leader to lead his people, but now his leadership role is completely different than Moses. Moses was all about how to wander through the wilderness. So now was one, one, how to wander one-on-one, that's all Moses. Now Joshua, they're at the verge now to take this next step. They're, they're almost at the, prom the promised land. Actually, they can see it from far off. And Joshua now is appointed to lead God's people to get to the promised land. One of my favorite books from seminary, I ended up having to, to, to look for it, is a book. This is, this is a book called Joshua, not, not the most clever name. But it, it gives ancient meditation of knowing who Joshua is. Actually, the meaning of his name is the same root in Hebrew as the name Jesus. So in Jewish scripture... He prefigures Jesus because of his leadership role and how he was appointed to bring liberty to God's people from bondage to the ultimate promised land. In essence, that's what Jesus did. Here we are in the story. Joshua is appointed to lead tens of thousands of people behind him, God's people. And they're here crossing another body of water, the, the, a river, in order to cross over to the promised land. And of course, as any leader, there's fear of the unknown. There's anxiety. He's wanting certainty of what will happen, and he is overwhelmed with anxiety as far as what his next step is required of him as a leader, as now he's the appointed leader after Moses. And this is where God tells him this. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, Joshua. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua didn't get any certainty. He didn't get any certainty from, from, from God. But he gained clarity of what was required of him right then, right now, and his journey to lead God's people to the promised land. Jesus, God didn't tell him, okay, Joshua, here you go. So we're going to do this first and then the second, and then you're probably going to do this. No. He says, 
Be courageous. I'm with you. I got you. Continues. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now, you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. So Joshua now is getting empowered by having clarity from God of what is required of him to, to, to lead with boldness, with courage. And because he knows that God is with him, he has clarity as far as what his next step is required of him. And as he's leading, Joshua says, okay, he delegates to the officers in this case, okay, pack up, we're ready. We're now going to cross over this body of water into new life. Here is the prefigure of, of Jesus. Here's a prefigure of our baptism. That Joshua, who prefigures Jesus, is telling his people, be prepared to cross over this body of water. This is where we will find life. This is the beauty. This is the, the, this is the most amazing thing of, if we look at the entire Holy Bible, is that there's this beautiful love story, this narrative of this thread of God working all throughout history. And, and it, it, these are not intentional, random, nice stories. Maybe some are confusing the Bible. No, there's a common thread of salvation. There's a common thread of healing through it all. And we see how God appointed Joshua, who prefigures Jesus, to, to lead his people, not with certainty, but with clarity. The basis of, for Joshua to lead was not because he knew what was coming. It's because of who he aligned himself with. Again, the basis for Joshua to lead was not because he knew what was coming. It's because of who he aligned himself with. This is ancient Jewish scripture. I would love to read to you a meditation, a commentary from an early Christian father. This is, his name is Saint Bochumius. You got to say it with a ch or Saint Bochumius, however you want to say. It. I remember in my, growing up, I heard Bochumius, and I went to seminary and I heard Bochumius. I'm like, who's that? Is that different? But anyway, Bochumius, Bochumius, tomato, tomato. It's the same guy. Saint Bochumius, in the year 320 AD, he was a Coptic monk, and actually he's honored in the Lutheran Church, the Catholic Church, and the Orthodox Church as a whole. So he's honored as, as, because of his writings and his leadership as a monk, uh, and he ended up, and he's obviously from, from Egypt. Uh, this was fascinating. He was the first monk to kind of write down and structure a daily rhythm or routine to monks, and as far as what we have from manuscripts of what he recorded from the 4th century. I'm debating to kind of share this, but anyway, this is what I ended up writing, uh, oh, what I found out about Sam Chomius. He ended up dying from, from, uh, from an epidemic, uh, but I, know, I don't know if it was a joke or just, I, it's your FYI. Anyway, but stay, don't go anywhere. Anyway, this is Sam Chomius' meditation to what he, when he read about the story of Joshua. Actually, I'm very happy you got, nobody was scared of that joke. I was kept on debating to say it. Yeah, but he ended up dying from an epidemic. Anyway, moving on. St. Bacomius said this, be valiant. When Joshua, son of Nun, that's, that, that's his dad's name, Joshua. When, when, when Joshua, son of Nun, was valiant. What is valiant? Is, is courageous, is bold. So, so, so St. Bacomius is saying, be, be courageous, be bold. When Joshua was, was valiant, when he was bold, God delivered his enemies into his hands. If you are faint-hearted, you know what faint-hearted is? Someone who is timid, shy, doesn't want to take that step in, in, into the unknown. If you are faint-hearted, you become a stranger to the law of God. Faint-heartedness fills you with pretexts for laziness, mistrust, and negligence until you are destroyed. Those are some heavy words. But I love how he, Sam Bechumius, he read the story and he sees the leadership of Joshua as he's reading this ancient Jewish manuscript. Sam Bechumius ends up writing this in the year 320 AD to be courageous. He says, when Joshua, son of Nun, was valiant, God delivered his enemies into his hands. If you are weak and timid or shy or faint-hearted, you become a stranger to the law of God. Faint-heartedness fills you with pretext for laziness, mistrust, and negligence until you are destroyed. If it's not for yourself, you and I see people all around us. You want them to take that bold step. You want them to take that step. But because of them being xenophobic, fear of the unknown, it debilitates them. And they're unable to take that step because they desire to have certainty all laid out in front of them. But if we align ourselves with the certainty of God working within you and me, 
then we know we have clarity on what the next step is required of us. Courage is not certainty. It's clarity. Courage is not, I, I'm certain of knowing what will happen. It's having clarity when we align ourselves with the one who is certain. It is okay to say, I don't know. Gentlemen, it's okay for us to say, we don't know. I remember advice I got when I first got ordained as a priest. Is somebody told me, say you don't know if you don't know. People are always going to think like you have the answers to everything. Say, I don't know. And, 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 and I try to own it. And for me to say, hey, I don't know, but you know what, I can't, let me come back and let me try to find something about that for you, or let me look into that, let me get some help on this myself, and I'll get back to you. It's okay for us to say we don't know, but we, can know, we, we, we don't need to be certain about everything. But we can have clarity of what's required of us for our next step. This is so, like, this goes against our, our, our logic. We want certainty. This is what puts us at ease. Promise me this will never, no, no I can't promise you anything. But I know what, I, there's clarity on what our next step. I can even just apply this for ministry. I don't know, I don't, I don't know where Sam Mark is going to be th th two months from now. I don't know where our permanent location is going to be. I don't know nothing. But I know what is required of us right now for us to have clarity, for us to continue to find healing and life in the beauty of our first century church at whatever capacity. I know that's, cl that's clarity for us what we can do right now. What does that look like for you? You desire certainty in some aspect of life. And maybe for some of us, it keeps us up at night. But do you have clarity on what is your next step? As Orthodox Christians, we take pride on saying we don't know. We take tremendous pride. And as the church can involve you, look at church history and you look at the Reformation. What drove a lot of the thought process and divisions in the church was it needs to make sure it needs to fit inside this cap of mine. It, it, the logic needs to fit. Uh, confession, don't understand, out. Communion, I don't understand, out. And this was evolution, with all respect to our brothers and sisters and other traditions. But what drove so much of the thought process and evolution of the church and the reformation of the church 500 years ago was if it, does not, if it's, if it doesn't make sense here, then it's out. But ever since the first century, many, tons of church fathers would say, we don't know. But we do know that the, the mystical supper, communion, is the body and blood of Christ. How, when, we don't know. But we know what Jesus made clear throughout his ministry. We, we know what he made clear on that Thursday night. We understood that. We have tons of manuscripts of how we, we need to apply that and, and live a sacramental, Eucharistic life. We know that. But how, what's the mechanism? We don't know. This is why we love to use the word mystery. And let me, let me confess. When I started questioning Christianity as a whole and orthodoxy as a whole. And, and I would start asking questions and people would say, mystery, mystery, mystery. I'd say, man, that's exactly why I should leave the church. That, that's my cop. If, if that's your cop out, just because you can't explain everything, you just say mystery. I don't want to be a church. Uh, I don't want to be part of a church that's, uh, that's so ignorant and uneducated, not knowing what to, to describe things. So they just say mystery. No. If, unless you can understand the mystery of how the divine put on skin and transcend the limitations of what death is and the physics of that and there's tons of, of evidence of this reality not this is not just a fair t fairy tale bible story but if, if we have tons of historical evidence recorded by skeptics of this reality then whatever follows forward it's not for me to understand in full comprehension i do not understand everything in life but i do know it for me to have clarity by aligning myself with the one who is certain I don't know a lot of things of, 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 of uh, many things. I don't even know where to begin. But I know for me to have clarity by aligning myself with God and knowing that I am created, but I belong to the creator. Sometimes we read the Bible and remove emotions from what we're reading. And we read it. It's fine. Can you read it at a scholarly level? Yeah. Can you read it as, uh, you can read it from, through different optics, through different lens. But many of us, we remove the emotion of some of these intimate conversations that Jesus had with his disciples. Jesus sat with his disciples. This is recorded by St. Matthew. He said this. Then Jesus came to them, his disciples, and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is about to peace out. He tells his disciples this. I'm with you. And go therefore and baptize in the name of the Trinity. Jesus was telling them, it is more important for you to do as opposed to understanding what is going to happen. It is more important for you to do as opposed to understanding what is going to happen. Jesus could have told his disciples anything. Hey, listen, Mark, things are about to get really rough in Egypt, so I'm just letting you know, okay, like this. No, he could have easily told them anything. But he told them, Lord, I'm with you. I want you to go and do as I am telling you. All authority from heaven and earth is within me, and I am entrusting you with that authority. And I want you to go and baptize. He gave them clarity on what is required of them right then, right now. Not certainty of what to expect. Jesus was telling them, have clarity and boldness in me. Have clarity and boldness. Be valiant. Be courageous in who I am working in you. I'm not going to give you certainty, but I want you to have trust in me in times of uncertainty. St. Mark, our patron saint of this church, He's a foreigner, walking to another foreign land of Egypt. Didn't know anything. He had no certainty of anything. But he did have clarity of knowing how radical his life was transformed because of the beauty and love of his heavenly father. And the only thing that was required of him was for him to have clarity on that and to have a conversation with people around that if it came up. Jesus didn't tell them, go stand on the street, go stand right next to the pyramid, make sure you hold up the sign and tell all these pharaonic people you're going to hell. No, he didn't tell them to do that. He said, I want you to go with clarity and baptize in the Holy Trinity. And surely I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Clarity is a person. Clarity is a person. We pray these words every divine liturgy. You manifested yourself to us, we who were sitting in darkness. You manifested yourself to us. How did this ethereal, uncreated deity reveal or manifest himself to us? Through a person. This is clarity. This is why Christmas is a big deal. It's not a, a, a nice winter holiday, it's the reality. It's not us climbing up a mountain to find the essence of life or for us to find, you know, a spiritual being, any of these uh, language that you might hear in other worldviews. No, it's clarity. It's clarity of this being manifested himself to us, we who were sitting in darkness and in the shadow of death. Him manifesting his love toward us is what gives us clarity, is what gives us the fullness of life. Today, in the liturgical calendar of the year, we honor St. Mary. Of, we read the, the record recorded by St. Luke of Archangel Gabriel coming to St. Mary. Did she have certainty of how this teenage girl is going to bear God within her womb? Did she have certainty of any of that? No. But she had clarity on knowing what God is asking of her right then, right now. I pray for us to have clarity on knowing that we are created by the creator, that we are limited, and he is unlimited. We're yearning for more. Our natural reflex, what causes so much anxiety for us and in this world is uncertainty, is uncertainty. But I want us to let go of us desiring to have certain, certainty in your career, in your finances, in your relationships. But let us have clarity of what is asked of us right now. Because clarity 
Desiring clarity is not just a, a psychological you know, theory or something nice. It is a person. He gave clarity to Joshua. He gave clarity to his disciples. And they transformed the world. And we are called to do the same. Let us stand up to pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Lord, if I'm honest with myself, do I want certainty on, on the, the life of my daughter, certainty in my marriage, certainty on, on, on where you will take St. Mark Church? Do I want certainty? Yeah. But I need to know that I am limited, and you are unlimited. And my life is in the palm of your hand. And your love for me is beyond my comprehension. But I want to let go of desiring certainty. I want to let go of, 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 of being paralyzed by the fear of the unknown. But what is this step of courage that I need to take? Joshua found that courage in you to cross the Jordan River for them to find the promised land. You gave clarity to the disciples for them to cross over into foreign countries and to foreign ideologies to tell them about the beauty and reality of who you are. We desire that same clarity. If you gave that clarity to Joshua and the disciples, we're not any different. Through the prayers of the beholder of God, St. Mark the Apostle, and all your saints, Lord, hear us as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sorry, can you guys have a seat for two minutes, please?